We turn now to the guy who, to whom uh, Secretary McCarthy deflected most of the questions. All right? uh, and unless you've been living under a rock, you know that, uh, that a year ago, there was no such thing as Army Futures Command other than an idea. But in August of last year, it became reality. And Secretary Esper and General Milley formally stood up and, and established United States Army Futures Command in Austin, Texas, and through a, a careful process, and in my humble opinion, the correct process, uh, selected the very first commander of the United States Army Futures Command, a 1982 graduate from The Ohio State University. Um, I owe, that's right, there's a couple of you out there. It's a good, it's a good thing. Please welcome the commander of the United States Army Futures Command, General Mike Murray. Well, thank you very much, sir. And to take care of some, uh, and it is hard to see up here, take care of some business first. So Ross Kaufman, are you in here? Stand up. So whoever had the question on OMFV, NGCV, talk to Ross, because we're interested. Because we, I've been through the requirements, uh, the proposed draft requirements document about six or seven times. We're pretty well convinced that threshold objectives are completely doable from today's technology, which was the goal going in, but Ross, We'll be very happy to, to answer the questions um, that you have on that, that document because we, we, we do want uh, your input. Uh, we're getting ready to deliver the, uh, what do we call that thing, the draft proposal? The RFP uh, by the end of this month. So uh, timing is critical. We get your input. So General Ham, thank you very much for the introduction. And, and when you were reading uh, from 1973, it, Gus and I were talking about, you know, we we're guessing what year that was going to be, and we were actually guessing like 1939 or 1940. So I think there's probably parallels throughout history of a very similar story. And it struck me when you said 1973, because I talk all the time about the similarities between where the Army is today and where the Army was coming out of Vietnam uh, in terms of a lot of striking similarities. So we have done this before in our history. Um, and I think to those out there, and this, there are probably not a lot in this room, but there are a lot of people that say history doesn't matter, but history absolutely matters uh, when you look at how we approach this. And for the, the Secretary, and, and your questions, um, I'm, I, I, he may be wishing he was back in D.C. testifying, uh, because at least you get a prep session for that, Mr. Secretary. And although I know you're happy to be here, I think you're probably the second happiest person. I think Laura is probably the happiest person uh, in the audience today with the arrival of, and congratulations to Mike Garrett uh, as the newest, and I'm glad to lose that title, Mike, the newest four-star in the Army. Um, so I've got the easy job. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of set up the panel, and you've got, uh, and you can see the names up here. You've got a pretty distinguished panel uh, coming. So uh, the Secretary mentioned Eric Wesley quite a bit. Uh, Eric has, has done yeoman's work on a lot of the efforts uh, that we're, even before, uh, he joined Army Futures Command, uh, of course, Sydney. And Sydney, I want to thank you for your articles. Um, they usually result in about five or six taskers from the Secretary of the Army, so you're one of the first things I read every morning. Um, of course, uh, Dave Johnson, uh, an author, prolific writer, and Dave, little known to most of you, uh, usually sends me an email about once a week, uh, and it's the history piece of this of, uh, that he really, really helps me. And then, of course, uh, Mr. Stephen Rodriguez and Bob Brown uh, coming from Indo-PACOM. I just sat through a great session with Bob and, and the Indo-PACOM commander uh, just about two or three days ago uh, to where multi-domain operations and what the Army is trying to do is really catching on, uh, not only in that theater, but also in UCOM as well. Uh, so we're starting to gain some traction there. And, I'm going to frame this, this scene setter, if you will, in, in terms of uh, really a follow-on to what the Secretary started with. Uh, and it's really going to focus on where we were, where we are, uh, where I believe we're going, uh, what has changed and what has not changed. Because I firmly believe that if you don't understand where you've been, it's hard to understand where you are. And if you don't understand where you are, there is no chance that you're going to figure out where you're headed in the future. Another way of saying that is, if you don't know where you're going, any road kind of gets you there. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on that. So where we were just a few years ago, and as I said, we were a similar spot that we found ourselves at the end of the Vietnam War. 
We had a very highly proficient coin force, but we had lost our high-end uh, near-peer competitor warfighting skills and a lot of the systems that sustained us uh, throughout the 80s and 90s. We had missed a generation of modernization for a couple reasons. One is we had been focused on providing our soldiers the equipment they needed for the fight they were in, which is absolutely the right thing to do. Second reason being that we had several signature failed programs throughout those two decades. Uh, on the order of about 30 or $40 billion, as Senator McCain was, was very happy to remind us every time we went to testimony. We had fundamentally the same equipment that I had when I was a young company commander. It had been incrementally upgraded over time. It was very capable equipment, but we were and we have reached the physical limits of the ability to upgrade that equipment. Our near peers had studied us, and they were catching up. They had developed a strategy of operational defense, better known as A2AD, and they had developed new and very effective long-range capabilities to implement that operational defense. We had BCA, and as my first couple years as a G8, the uh, Budget Control Act and sequestration was always, always a topic of conversation. And for the three years I was a G8, and this year we are building a BCA Palm just because you don't know what's going to happen when the budget goes up. We had years of suppressed defense budgets, and we, at one point I think the number was eight continuing resolutions in a row. So funding uh, resources were very unpredictable and very unstable, and it's hard to develop a plan when, when that's true. And we had a modernization enterprise split between two ACOMs, the R staff, and the Secretariat. And your questions, and the Secretary made this very, very clear, and I get asked all the time why AFC. It was because until we stood up AFC, the only four people in the Army that could answer the questions you were asking were the Chief, the Secretary, the Undersecretary, and the Vice Chief of Staff. That's where all the modernization synchronization came together, and that's just a terrible forum to try to, to, to make those four into staff officers for synchronization. So where are we today? And we've talked about some of the six Army modernization priorities, which the Secretary rattled off, eight CFTs managing 30-some, and it varies day to day, but 30-some signature programs uh, with direct Army senior leader oversight. Every Monday morning at 1040 Central, uh, 9, or 940 Central, 1040 Eastern, uh, I sit through an update with the chief, the secretary, the vice, and the under, and one of the CFT directors is at the building updating them on their programs. Last year, Congress, uh, although begrudgingly supported a $1 billion plus above threshold reprogramming effort to get us started, and we would not be where we were, are today if it had not been for that support. And it really changed the course, and as the secretary said, primed the pumps for the efforts to come. The $30 billion realignment that the Secretary talked about was absolutely critical to continuing that effort. And as he mentioned, there is more realignment coming. As a matter of fact, this afternoon I'm going to sit through a VTC with the Secretary and I, and I believe General McConville uh, to talk about this year's realignment. Modernization priorities are fully funded. Uh, every time we go in and talk to the Chief and the Secretary, that's the first question I get is, are the modernization priorities fully funded? And the answer is absolutely yes. And there is more funding coming than what you saw in this year's budget drop. We have begun building some very fruitful and strong relationships with some key universities, startups, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and of course, I have tried to very closely monitor AFC and really the Army's relationship with you, uh, the traditional defense industry. As Secretary mentioned, mentioned uh, Multi-Domain Operations 1.5 has been published. Eric is furiously working on 2.0, and it is a joint document working very, very closely with the Air Force, the Marine Corps, and now the Navy, and, and, and of course the Joint Staff J7 to make sure we're nested within the Chairman's new concept of joint operations. And soon to follow will be the next iteration of the Army Modernization Strategy 1.5, which should be out this summer, which, as the Secretary mentioned, will be a cross.mil PF. And then soon to be published, uh, really published, but soon we've got to come back and figure out uh, whether everybody can do it or not, is the Army Modernization Guidance. So for the first time, you have strategy driving, not the first time, first time in recent memory, you have strategy driving our modernization. And 
of course, you have AFC, and I like to describe Army Futures Command as a startup managing a merger uh, with one ACOM, that being me, focused on this problem set that we're gathered here today to discuss. And within Army Futures Command, for those of you not familiar with it, uh, the old ARCIC, now Futures and Concepts Center, led by General Eric Wesley, the old RDECOM, now the Combat Capabilities Development Center, led by Major General Cedric Wins, the AI Task Force at Carnegie Mellon University and partnered throughout the country, uh, led by Brigadier General Matt Easley, the Army Applications Lab, co-located with me in Austin at the Capital Factory, which is a incubation accelerator hub. And the unique thing about the Army Applications Lab is we are co-located with uh, DIU, the former DIUX, uh, AFWorks, which is the Air Force equivalent, uh, equivalent from the Neo, uh, National Geospatial Agency, and Softworks will probably establish a presence all on the eighth floor, all addressing problems for the Department of Defense in very non-traditional ways. Um, DS to me is the 75th Innovation Command located in Houston, Texas, U.S. Army Reserve Command, and ATEC is also DS, so I have control over their priorities and their funding. And it's really strong, uh, well, already was strong, but a growing relationship between Bruce Jetty and the entire ASALT team. And I was just recently joined by Major General Pat Burden, uh, who will be my uh, acquisition professional, present and permanent in my headquarters, working directly for me with direct oversight of the programs the CFTs are managing. So where are we going? MDO, you're going to start hearing these terms, MDO capable force of 2028 and an MDO ready force of 2023. And that really brings together everything the secretary talked about. So it's the structure, it's the equipment that the, the CFTs are working on, and it's really the, the multi-domain operations and how we organize, uh, not only from an equipping standpoint, but from a structure standpoint. And part of that discussion is modularity, our current organizational construct the right way forward for multi-domain operations. Uh, there's people in both camps, so that discussion will continue uh, in the near term, uh, but how do we organize structurally and how do we put, if we do, uh, echelon capabilities back into the Army to fight multi-domain operations? You'll hear conversations about vertical versus horizontal modernization. Uh, so. Even if I come up with next generation combat vehicle in the timeline we're talking about, it will take us years to get it fielded throughout the Army. So do we, and I'll just uh, simply put, horizontally modernize, in other words, spread the peanut butter, or do we vertically modernize to where a single BCT gets all new capability at once? And then we, do we focus that on specific BCTs that will be required for a specific war fight? You're gonna see a lot of prototyping and a lot of developmental ops. And IVAS that the Secretary mentioned is probably the clearest and brightest example of what we talk about when we say developmental ops. So I have uh, three squads, uh, one from the 75th Ranger Regiment, one from SOCOM, and one from a General Purpose Force uh, Division that are almost currently, or almost constantly uh, stationed in Redwood, um, Washington. Redmond, Redmond, Washington, co-located with Microsoft, with Microsoft engineers developing this capability. I just up at uh, Fort Pickett a couple of days ago, saw the capability, and it is in Inc. 1, uh, Increment 1 absolutely uh, will change the way our dismounted infantry uh, fights on a future battlefield. As I said before, CFT efforts, those, those signature programs, fully funded and will remain fully funded. And then we will continue to align our S&T, RDT, and E resources to make sure that they are aligned against the Army's priorities. Okay, so let's move on to, to what has changed. And, and this is about uh, what this panel, I think, is supposed to be about, is the changing character of war. And, and, and there's probably a lot of Closet Clausewitz fans in the audience. So the nature of war has not changed. The, the fact that war is just an extension of politics will probably never change. But Clausewitz also talked about thing, the thing called the spirit of the age. And when he said the spirit of the age, I equate that to the changing character of, of warfare. So the, the rate of innovation, a lot of people say the rate of innovation has changed and it has only sped up. And I'm not sure that's entirely true. I think the rate of innovation has been happening and speeding up for quite a while. We're just catching on to the fact 
that we're way behind in, in terms of the rate of innovation. And if there's anything that I think is a constant, that it will continue to accelerate. It is not going to slow down. It is not going to wait for us. And we're going to have to change the way we do business to take advantage of that rate of innovation. Government investment in technology uh, and technology research and development is way down. Uh, back in the 60s, it was about three government dollars for every private dollar that was going into technology, innovation, and research. Today, it's about six industry dollars to every government dollar. So we will not drive technology, research, uh, development, science, and technology. We're going to have to capitalize on what the commercial industry is doing. There is a huge exfiltration of technology and knowledge leaving this country every day. And if you're not familiar with the topic, uh, you ought to be, and you ought to be concerned about it. So the question becomes, how do we protect the technology we're developing, and how do we protect the knowledge uh, that is being gained in a lot of different places. New and developing technologies you're all familiar with, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, quantum computing and quantum communications, biotechnologies, material sciences, energetics, hypersonics, directed energy, microsats, explosion of a LEO constellation. The Army is trying to position itself to take advantage of all of this. But those things, maybe not individually, more likely in a combination, will fundamentally change the character of war as we go into the future. We have an increased top line, as the Secretary mentioned, and it gave us the opportunity to turn the ship and to start down this path. And I think the other thing that has fundamentally changed is the Army's willingness to admit that we had a problem. Uh, we didn't hunker down behind sandbags. Uh, we stood up and we said, we have a problem and we have to fix it. And that resulted in the largest reorganization in the United States Army since 1973 to get after this very specific problem. So what has not changed? I would say to those in the audience, is, as much as I talk about startups and entrepreneurs, is we cannot do this without you. Our reliance on the tradi traditional defense industry to do things at scale and produce the things that we need has not changed and will not change. We will continue to rely on you, work with you, uh, to produce what we need to produce. And it's still a joint problem and a joint solution. Uh, there is no way the Army will ever be able to fix this uh, on their own. And Sydney, I appreciate your, your question about uh, the joint services. And, and Eric spends a lot of time uh, working with uh, ACC, and General Holmes was down to see me a couple weeks ago uh, with Fleet Forces down in Norfolk, uh, with the Joint Staff J7, who's in Suffolk, uh, and then, of course, at Quantico with the Marine Corps. And so this is a very MDO, MDO 1.5, MDO 2.0 is a very joint document from inception, and we will, we will continue to make it joint. We still need uh, to build and sustain our alliances and partnerships. Uh, we have relied on partnerships for the last decades, uh, and we will continue to rely on that. There is absolutely no way the United States Army or the United States can go this alone and ever hope to succeed throughout the world. Um, we still need to recruit, train, and retain the best soldiers in the world. And I do believe that if the United States has an asymmetric advantage, it is our soldiers and our mission command philosophies. Uh, the national debt has not changed, and this goes back to something the Secretary was walk talking to. BCA is still out there. The JSIDS process has not fundamentally changed. The FAR process has not fundamentally changed, although Congress has been very gracious in some uh, recent authorities in terms of OTAs, 804 authorities, 806 authorities, et cetera. But we've got to fundamentally figure out how to use that system to our advantage as opposed to using it as an excuse. There are ways to use the FAR. Uh, not everything will be an OTA, uh, but we've got to figure out how to use the systems we have to our advantage and then not be bashful about telling Congress where continued reform is needed. And what your Army is working through, and AFC is focused on, along with great partners at TRADOC, uh, Gus Perna at AMC, Steve Townsend at TRADOC, and now Mike Garrett at Forcecom, we'll get to the solutions that the Army's after. Uh, we will get to the solutions probably not along uh, everybody's expected timelines, but there are some very, very tough decisions that have to be made uh, along a fairly ambitious uh, timeline. And your Army leadership is focused on making those decisions, and your Army is focused on building the best Army we possibly can uh, for a future fight. 
And that's, that's fundamentally what AFC exists to do. I tell people all the time, it's not necessarily about those of you sitting in the audience today in uniform. It's about our children and it's about our grandchildren and making sure that they're able to fight, defend, win in a very, very complex battlefield, a very lethal battlefield, and bring their soldiers home. And that's what motivates me every day to come to work. That's what I talk to uh, the 25,000 or so that are now part of AFC. And that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. So thanks for your time today. Like I said, uh, anybody filling out cards, they go to the panelists. I'm not taking any questions. Um, but I appreciate the attendance today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. And, and I really appreciate working with you in the future uh, to bring this enterprise together to really get after what the Army needs in the future. So thank you very much. And Sydney, I think I turn it over to you.